Hi, everyone. I'm Joey Reese. Welcome to the Practice Center, where we're going to be talking about all things mindfulness, forgiveness, and attitudinal healing. Hi, Darby. I'm so happy to be with you this morning. Likewise. You look beautiful, by the way. You look you. mature and grown. Like you look really different. It must have been a while since I've seen you. It's been an eventful year. <laughs> wow. Okay, I would love for you to in in part to the world who you are. Who are you, Darby? Pre mindful forgiveness. I definitely just kind of trudged through life and I think I took things as they came, but I didn't really take like the lessons from them and I just kind of went through life uh, on a very surface level. And even though I was working in this field of social services and I was doing a lot with like emotional health and mental health, it wasn't really something that I knew how to practice for myself. It was just something that it was just talk and it was just in my brain. It wasn't something that was part of my life. And now post MF, life is definitely up and down. I'm in my late twenties. I've got a lot going on, but I think that the main thing now is that I'm better able to have that separation of awareness where I can not fully like I'm not this emotion I'm just experiencing this emotion and even though it might be a shitty emotion or it might be a really joyful emotion I also feel like I really feel the highs and lows even more but I don't think that's necessarily a, a bad thing I think it's just part of being human and sometimes I catch myself in those moments where I am feeling something that's very difficult or uncomfortable or I'm feeling something that's very happy and light and I and I really say to myself wow this is being human because it's just such a wide spectrum all at one time sometimes wow. so I would say the biggest thing now with Darby is just really feeling those feelings oh that's so beautiful what else are you what are you doing who are you um, in what kind of embodiment do you walk through this planet, this life? How do other people identify you? Any of those things to, to clarify who you are, that would be helpful. I think the first thing that comes to mind is I'm a multiracial woman. So I walk through this world with many different cultures and ethnicities behind me. I'm also part of, um, I'm in my late twenties. So I think that that's telling of kind of where I am in my life and what's going on. It's definitely kind of a time of like an uphill climb, which I'm aware of. I have a daughter. I'm a granddaughter. I'm a girlfriend, a friend. I'm also a student. So I'm in graduate school right now for acupuncture and Chinese medicine. I just finished my first year and I'm going into my oh second. Oh my God. Yeah. I work at Hanaho. Do you know the shop downtown? It's like a, they do like zero waste and it's like perpetuating Polynesian culture and it's all like handicraft, like really vintage, beautiful items. And so, I mean, it is a sales job, but I feel like I, I have no problem selling these items because I like, I think they're very beautiful. And it's just something that's nice because I can kind of go there and I'm just present and I just kind of like shuffle out my work and then I come home and there's nothing else I need to do besides yeah. my other things I need to do. I want to hear a little bit about some of those titles you gave me, multi-ethnic woman, girlfriend, daughter, granddaughter, student. Out of all of those, is there any one category that stands out that you had to manage the most, that you had to, the most that you had to spend energy on um, in terms of becoming who you are? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think the one that really stands out is being a multiracial woman, just because growing up, um, you know, it was hard to find my place. And I think that was like culturally the way that I looked, I was either like too Asian to be with the white people or like too white to be with the Asian people. And so I think it's kind of this edge walking that becomes internalized, like this feeling. And I know everybody feels this. It's not just, it's just- But how did you feel it? Because that's what's interesting. I think the way that I felt it, it, it was just very much a feeling of being other or not having a place. Like there was nobody in my family that looked like me. Like I didn't, like I looked like my mom and my dad, but of my immediate family, I couldn't relate to like the Thai side because I couldn't speak Thai. I grew up in America. And then like with the American family, I 
you know, did things differently, ate different foods, practiced different medicine. Like the, even within my parents, there was differences, right? So I, I wasn't really like either one of my parents, but I was like both of them at the same time. So I think there was just this very internalized feeling of, of being different or confusing. Um, and I don't think I really understood that until I got older and, and it was really confusing, but that was like the lens that people saw me. And I don't think that they really thought too much of it, but mm. the way as a child that it affected me, I think it traversed deeper into like my layers. You very quickly, as you were saying, it was like being othered, but I know everybody goes through that. We say that so fast, right? Yeah. The very definition of trauma that we use in this work is a felt it's a felt sense of a separation from either safety, belonging, or dignity, like all yeah. three of those. So we can very easily go, oh, somebody grew up in a war zone. Oh my God, that's traumatic. But when you say like very specifically looking around your immediate family and, and the people around you at your school, I was feeling othered. I didn't belong. That is the definition of trauma. Why do you think we so quickly throw that away? Why did you so quickly dismiss that? Yeah, um, I didn't even catch that. So <laughs> it's good to, ref to hear that reflection back but I think just I think part of it and maybe this is like to my fault is that that understanding or like that empathy or compassion that like everybody experiences this like everybody experiences feeling other maybe it's not because of their their ethnicity or their racial background but because of their gender or their sexual identity or because of their I don't know like it could be so many um so I think like that feeling of otherness is something that I know as humans we all relate to um um, and this just happens to be my like specific big one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though we can say that, because that's part of the, the work that we do is expanding and seeing that, oh, it's not just me, it's everybody. But on the other end of that is if we don't identify that that is my pain, then how can we heal? Because yeah. the first part of it is by, by, it's about acknowledgement and being heard. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to go, even though it seems small in the scheme of, it's our everything. Especially if you think about 10 year old Darby. I don't know what you were experiencing, but that felt sense of being other. I mean, I viscerally remember that. And if I go, oh, but it wasn't a big deal. Then I can't lean into this work of now this Darby, who is more self-possessed and really understanding your place in this world and have been able to do healing work because that pain was legit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that other, that, that swing of really going, no, that was a big deal. I think yeah. is important. Not trying to like Joey sitting here making Darby, like feel it, feel it. It's not yeah. like that, but it's like <laughs> all of us. If we can't feel the bigness of that separation from belonging then how can we ever figure out how to connect yeah so because you've done that work of connecting whether with awareness or out of awareness I don't know and that's what I'm interested in finding out but you mm -hmm. definitely have made some sort of journey from one to the other yeah definitely a big one yeah so whatever else you can fill me in on that I will try not to interrupt <laughs> <laughs> it's okay I mean I think it was just like like pursuing um, an education, like from undergraduate. And like, I think I've always, because I had this like deep questioning and confusion, I think that brought me to pursue specific subjects that helped me like understand culture and understand humans and understand like the way that all of that ties into a society. Um, and I think like going through, I think specifically my undergraduate was when I really started to put words to the way that I was feeling about this. Like, like I took a class on multi-ethnic studies and it was, we read a book called Edgewalkers. And it was the first time I read this book and I was like, wow, like there's somebody that can very accurately describe what it is that people of mixed race experience. We, we walk these different edges and kind of belong nowhere and everywhere at the same time. Yeah. And the, the feeling of doing like a legal document and not having a box to check, yes. which I'm noticing that the boxes like came for a while and now there there's less boxes. I yes. don't know if you noticed that as well, but like lately the boxes have changed and it's like, wait, I had this privilege and now it's gone. <laughs> So of like marking my proper box. So now I'm like, okay, I just don't my identify. Box. Yeah. Like I want to be two or more races. I don't want to be like either one. Right. So I just, now I just don't identify because I'm like, you don't give me a place to identify. I'm not going to. Yeah. 
I used to tell my kids when they we would have that conversation all the time because I'm multiracial and so are they. Yeah. And they would we I specifically remember them asking and I say you check whatever box is going to give you the most money. <laughs> nobody knows they don't get to know so screw them. Yeah. <laughs> That's smart. I, I should don't probably know that it ever me. worked in our favor, but that was kind of my stance. Yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah we all have like our different relationship with the boxes that we have to check but yeah like just just I think that's when I started to become like a young adult and go into the world on my own a little bit more it's when I started to put words to that but then when I really graduated college and got like pushed into the world I think and also being in California where it is there is um a lot of cultural diversity Mm -hmm. but there's also like a very under like it's it's subtle and it's not subtle like of a cultural like hierarchy and and I think that kind of existed within like like just this very concentrated southern California area um so on one end I got to really experience the beauty of different cultures I got to have all the different foods and and go to school with different kinds of people and like it was wonderful. Um, and then being older and, and moving and relocating with my family back to Hawaii, that was its own experience because now everybody looks like me and I'm the majority. And that feeling of belonging finally started to, to make sense from like a racial perspective. So you do feel like you belong here on the big island. I do. Yeah. And it's, this is like, like culturally in my home, this was the dominant culture. Um, and like as far as food like this was the dominant food that we ate was food from here and so yeah coming here and like going to the grocery store and seeing people that look like me or um or getting reflections everywhere yeah and that that feeling is um helped a lot of my my beliefs around community Mm. and um connection even and I think I don't know if I would have had that same feeling if I remained in Southern California I think it would have still been kind of like fragmented and severed like you go here you go here you go here whereas here it's all just fluid and so yeah I think and then now being older and and going back to school for Chinese medicine like it's kind of that like the deepest layer I think of it all and that feels extremely healing to even just uncover like recipes or different things that I know that my ancestors had somewhere down the line. Like that's, there's something just very, very in my body spirit that's comforting about that. Yeah. So you come back home in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel very, I feel very grateful and privileged that I kind of had this like inner journey that brought me here at I feel like at such a young age, because mm-hmm. um, I know that many people don't don't always have that. No. So I've had all of the I've had like all of the forces that kind of molded me in this way. And, but you've also taken proactive action to make that mm-hmm. happen. So if I I ask the question, and I'm always curious about how people navigate themselves around the thoughts that they have. And how connected is it to the emotions? Do they link it to the emotions that they're having? And then do they know the behaviors that are attached to it? What are they doing or avoiding doing around that thing? So when it comes to the way that you walk through life, specific to this racial identity, because that's what we're talking about right now. um, Before, what were your predominant thoughts? What were the emotions that were attached to that? And what did you notice you're doing or not doing in terms of your life? And then how is it now when you feel more at home, And when you feel this fluidity, what do you think? What's your predominant thoughts? What emotions are connected to that? And then what do you notice doing or not doing that might be different than the pre-Darby? Yeah, I think a a very stark difference when I was um, like through my adolescence and young adulthood, I was very prideful in my apathy. Like I was very prideful in... um, like being hyper independent and like broke up with a boyfriend, cried for one night, fine forever. (laughs) Like that kind of, that was like exactly me. I was like, oh, I'm fine. I, I, there's no, there was no connection of like thought, emotion, behavior. It was just disembodied. It was disembodied. And it was also very like guarded. Like I, I used to, I used to be that person that say like, yeah, I never cry. (laughs) Like I never, I never cry when I watch movies and, um, I, I very like that was part of something that I 
identified with. Like it was something that I put up as my shield in the world that I can, I'm fine. I can take care of myself. And I remember all of my friends when, when like bad things would happen, they would say, you're strong, Darby, you got this, like get through, you'll be fine. You're strong. And I, I heard that so much. So much. Um, and I, in reality, looking back, I realized I wasn't really strong. I was just <laughs> protecting myself and maybe dissociating and, and, um, and also like being, I think like my college years were really um, formative because I had a lot of, like I was very active in clubs and on a dance team. So I was always around people and feeling sad. Okay, go meet up with somebody and get food or go dance or go do whatever. Um, so it was, it was, there was no opportunities to really get still and understand what was happening, but um, but I definitely see that I did have some behaviors, especially in like interpersonal relationships that were coming from those, those deep emotions of like not belonging mm -hmm. and wanting to belong, like wanting to like attach to somebody or something or to some relationship or yeah, like all of that is still there, but I'm just aware of it. So I'm aware when I'm distracting and sometimes I still let myself just distract myself. Like sometimes I'm like, it's fine. I'm just going to zombie scroll for a while. or I'm just going to like do this thing because I need it to cope in this moment. But I, I think the biggest difference now is I'm extremely emotional. Like almost sometimes I think it's like, it's, it's difficult because I have, I realize now I have so many emotions. I have so many responses to the world and especially I think the world that has happened the past couple of years and, and going through all of that as I enter like my adulthood, I think that's definitely shaped me in many ways just to, to see all of that and experience all of it. And yeah, so Different I definitely- kind of exhausting, isn't it? It's freaking exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, like in, in full transparency, this year was really, really rough for me. Like, especially the latter half of the year, I just like everything tapped out. Like I tapped out, my body tapped out. Like, and, and I think it was just from pushing through for so long and, and also just adjusting to many different life changes um, and maybe not really taking the time I needed to, to have enough stillness or to have enough movement even. Um, and just kind of being very like, it was just like very stagnant and heavy. Yeah, but this year I think was really kind of the year like I felt like, I don't know, like I adult, I definitely like adulted this year. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> you crossed the line. You're definitely, definitively on this end of adulting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like, whoa, this is a lot. But yeah, at the same time, I feel so grateful that I do have, I think a more solid understanding of like how I react to these things and how, what I need to comfort myself or to just like what I need to give to myself. Yeah. And I've definitely found a lot of healing in, in school and the medicine that I'm learning and, and the mindful forgiveness practices, like they've become second nature to me almost. Not that I'm like going through every single step every single day, but when something arises, I'm able to kind of have more uh, systems to be with it. Yes. So it's not just like this, <laughs> like blob of emotion that's just spewing out of me or getting stuffed into me. It's just, I think I'm able to kind of like clarify it all more. Clarity. And Clarity. that's not necessarily like the, the end all be all, but it's a huge help. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the end all be all, you know, um, I'm just going to rewind just a little bit when mm -hmm. your presence and your demeanor and I, I know that every time I bring up your name, everybody says this to me. So I can't imagine how often you get it. But every time I go, oh, Darby, people go, oh my God, she's so sweet. Oh my God, she's just so gentle. Oh my God, she's so kind. Oh my God, it's all, and they use that voice. It's higher and it's like gentle. And I'm thinking, oh my God, she will cut a bitch. Because that's how I know you. That's the part I know you. And, but in all reality, it's both and. Yeah. Which is, it's, 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 that's the segment that you wrote about in the questionnaire before we chatted here. And yeah. I was like, Darby embodies both and. She is so loving and so kind. When I know that there's somebody who can't deal with this kind of, ah, in your face energy, I'm like, have Darby guide you. Have Darby <laughs> guide you because your demeanor. But then you slip in and you'll, ah, cut them <laughs> which is my favorite 
So talk to me a little bit about both and, and how yeah. you live in this world of both and maybe explain it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And then just some about your mindfulness journey, anything that you would like to talk about how you got roped in and then why you've stayed and why you facilitate. So just take me through all of that that feels appropriate for you. I'm starting with both and. I think going through my first group, both and was one of the, like the, the stress reduction, both and week was one of, it was like the turning point for me mm-hmm. in the whole, in, the, in my first time going through the process. Like my, my initial grief period was kind of like intense when I was first going through it because it was the first time I was really like letting myself grieve something and having support around that too and then both and was kind of like it was like a way like two simple words that gave me language for the way that I want to understand the world because very clearly through my experience the world is very like black and white like it's this or that you're here or there I think I was really searching for a way to describe the nuance of life that I was I was starting to become more aware of like as I got I think I was like 23 when I did my first group or something like that so I was just starting to kind of like put my foot in the world and be like oh it's really not so clear cut it's just all gray area and so both and I use it all the time like I literally use both and every single day and I think everybody in my circle knows that I use it all the time because it's just it's just like something that makes so much sense of human nature and and the human experiences that we are very multi-dimensional we have so many different parts of us and we experience so many emotions and and for me I notice many of them are happening at the same time and we have different multiple wants and needs and they all exist at the same time as well and so I think both and for me has, has been very transformational in the way that I look at the world and that it's often not always just as we see it it's there's so many like layers and different elements that that make something what it is and so I think yeah both and is is really big for me Um, and it's something that I try and share a lot in just the work that I do and in my community and like the people around me it's just trying and even if I'm not specifically using the words both and it's just the understanding that maybe it's this and that (laughs) and and more that we just don't know and I'm I feel like it's also helped me be a lot more compassionate especially towards people that I might have like normally judged or, or people that um, bother me. <laughs> like I try and just be aware of the fact that like I'm irritated. Maybe there's something I don't know that's going on. Maybe like I, I really try and like give people the benefit of the doubt. And maybe that's like to a fault in some people's eyes. But for me, it feels better to be like that. Like yesterday, for example, we were driving down saddle and there was it was raining. It was dark and there was a car driving 35 miles per hour and braking aggressively and so everybody was getting mad and passing them and it was just a very dangerous situation maybe they're not from a rainy area maybe it's an uncle that had to drive somewhere in the middle of the night they don't usually drive at night so like I I just really try and think about all the different scenarios that could make somebody have this behavior that is still causing like other people suffering or whatever I'm just like you know what I'll do my best to be safe I'll do my best to manage my emotions around this and I don't need to be mad about this. Like I can right. just drive slow and enjoy the ride. <laughs> Otherwise the it's that person in front of me is purposely breaking and driving slow to make me late or to get yeah. right. <laughs> Which is. Yeah. And I, and I could see that happening in the cars around, like they were very irritated. Like it was very evident by the way that everybody was driving. Like this is creating a nuisance on the road yeah. and, and yeah, both, both and really just makes a lot of sense to me. And I feel like as I've gotten older, it's really helped me to also just not be so rigid with my thinking, like just to be a lot more fluid. And that just feels really good. So what made you stay? So you were part of the first round of groups. So these first interviews are with my first round of folks who, let me just say that people now have more of a choice to come to group (laughs) than (laughs) y'all might have had that I know much of the yeses were because of our relationship and not so much that look at this program it's awesome you guys said yes to me and i appreciate that so much and i recognize that Uh, Mm -hmm. but your choice to stay after 
and then become a facilitator and continue to do this work. That was all you. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. After finishing our first group, it just, it helped me so much with taking some, like a story that I didn't even know was a story. And again, not the end all be all, but I just had some clarity around something in my life that was causing me discomfort and struggle and was playing out in my behaviors in my internal like my deeper internal world also coming from a world of like social work and talk therapy and all of that I was like okay like this stuff is cool but I was also at the same time questioning the effectiveness of it just for me personally going through this group where it was not therapy it was just presenting a concept and me dealing with that (laughs) that was new and it was something that I was just really curious about it just seemed a lot more like relatable and tangible at the same time I just liked that mindful forgiveness like the six or seven modules was like just we go through the modules and it was just very nice for my brain to have some structure around that so I wasn't too much structure man yeah and I don't know if I told you this but I got diagnosed with ADHD this year oh you did I did yeah I really need sometimes these structures to help me to help me like stay on a path so I think that was extremely appealing for me with mindful forgiveness and then I was kind of going through like my own like work career transformation during that time so I was just really curious about mindful forgiveness and that's what brought me to the training going through that first training and seeing like wow this is how many people this has really influenced in a positive way and and seeing that like wow this is something that there's a lot of history behind it, but there's also a very clearly a future to it as well. And then I think what has really helped me stay is community of people in mindful forgiveness is all of the facilitators and then even all of the different participants that have come through groups that I've somehow been a part of or groups that I've led or, or anything like that. It's just a wonderful group of people. And I think the amazing thing is it's also such a diverse group of people. There's so many different ages and and people from all kinds of walks of life and all over the globe and they come together and it's just this shared goal of creating more peace and working to create a different relationship with it like if there's a group of people to be around right now in the world like it's people that are doing this there's some crazy shit going on so (laughs) so going on if you just find good people you just stick with them and you and like we're so much better together at the same time and and it's really not humane for everybody to be that hyper independence it only goes so far Mm -hmm. and I think the older I've gotten the more I've like gone through my career and just like my personal healing the more I've realized that that we really are so much better with support and community and I think that that's what's really kept me with my forgiveness that just makes me think about the whole idea of belonging and that that whole facade because I'm really trying to belong to this homogenous group that really aren't like independent people they all behave in a certain way you all wear the same kind of bangs you wear the same kind of clothes And so I try to do that to fit in. But the reality is that everybody is super unique. So what this work brings up for me is that when Darby does her work, Darby becomes more uniquely Darby, Mm -hmm. which makes and gives me permission to be more uniquely Joey. And Mm -hmm. in our unique, uniquely different difference, we're all same in that we're striving to figure out how to survive this life. And that is what brings the community together. It's not some vision of homogeny that I'm trying to belong to right the environment that is created with that is like the the modules are like the 40 percent and everything else is like 60 percent that's what creates the real healing the connection um, the real connection yeah yeah I mean that's what the World Health Organization says is the number one deterrent to um to suicide yeah yeah is is connection precisely I think what our work is And so one of the most beautiful moments that I remember with you, there's many, but one of them is our conversation when you were like, hey, I'm thinking about going back to school for Chinese medicine. And the way that you were presenting that, I'm going to tear up, was somebody who was like, yeah, I know where my home is and I'm going to go there. And this is how I'm going to relate to the rest of the world in a way that is going to lean into my gifts 
but also in a way that allows me to be me and be free. And that is the actions. You were like, this is what I'm doing with my life, but I think this is how I want to connect with my culture and my community and my world. Can you tell me about what was happening on your end? I knew that there's something about this that feels different than all of my other paths or choices that I've made. It was something that I had kind of had like little like inklings of for I think a couple of years, but also I think I didn't have the confidence to pursue, to make that choice. It kind of just became this very persistent voice. And it wasn't, you know, I think like when we talk about the difference between fear and intuition, like fear is usually like kind of a chaotic voice and intuition is usually very, not really a voice. It's just that, that feeling in your body. It's like from your gut <laughs> for this, it was, there was just something that when I made the call to the school to find out more about it, like the registration had just opened, like everything was just kind of the doors were just opening and flowing right into place with very little effort. Like there's something. <laughs> on my side helping me do this. There's something so poetic about it all and the way that it's it was created, the way that it's written and taught. It's um, And then it's also very rooted in like science, also like kind of esoteric, a huge both and. Yeah. Um, and then there's also, I really try and as I'm doing my learning, like I try and really take the, the traditional sides of it and like that poetic side of it. And I try and really relate it to like the biomedical side of it because I like those two worlds meeting a lot. And I think they meet very well. And I think people don't understand that. <laughs> I think they, it's very much like this or that, but it's, it's also like the way that I'm learning, the way that I'm seeing it is like, there's many times where you need both. Cause the point I wanted to make is, I think my job is to be a translator. This is Fred Luskin's work from the Stanford Forgiveness Project. Yeah. And yet I know that when he's been coming here since the 90s, the amount of people who have stayed in this work are much less than what we've been able to create. Mm -hmm. Because I think I do a great job of translating this work. And that's what I see in you. You are now seeing these two worlds. It's not new work. Yes. Like and you are a that. translator of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you were the connector for that. Yeah. And that seems so right to me. Um, proud of you. So proud of you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear two more things. One, I heard you say this was a tough year, but also both and. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing there were some things that were A-OK. -okay. So I'd like for you to think about 2021 because we're almost at the end of it while mm -hmm. we're filming this. What are you the most proud of? My like determination, I guess. Tenacity. Tenacity, yeah. Yeah, like just, this was my first year going back to school, graduate school, and adjusting life around that and making that my focal point. Um, but then doing the work around that, my finals at the beginning of December, it was like the hardest finals I've ever had in my life. But I know I like walked into that final and I was like, I kicked ass. Oh my um, God, that's so great. Yeah, like it was, it was a good feeling. To, um, so I, I think I'm most proud of just, getting through that first year and getting through this year and setting um, a goal for myself. I, I really don't like to use the word goals sometimes, but I feel like just getting through this first year, um, I'm really proud of that. Oh, so good. Finally, um, you have a brand new person that is a Darby-esque person walking around. Is there a clear, concise, actionable advice or a nugget of gold that you can give them they're asking you darby what should i do where should i start mm. is there any anything that you can tell that person the first thing that comes to mind is go take a walk <laughs> <laughs> but not in like a like a get out kind of way like actually like just go for walks like go take a walk like be with yourself like be with nature move your body forward take a walk. so if people wanted to take a class with you a workshop with you um, whenever that might be in 22, how do they find you? Where's What's the best place for them to get information about Darby? They can find me on Instagram at Darby.Sherman, or they can email me, same thing, Darby.Sherman at gmail.com. Luckily, there's not too many Darby Shermans. Yeah. Um, okay, final word. Final word. I don't know. I feel like 2022 is going to be magical. I think it's still going to be hard. I think it's still going to be like really intense and there's still going to be a lot of shit going on, but I just feel like there's going to be some like magic to it that is a little bit kinder 
And I really feel that. And I, I, I feel like there's just a lot at play that is making the right movement. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks for sitting down and chatting with me. Really appreciate it, Darby. Thank you for the invite. This was, this was very nice. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.